So thank you very much. Um, so thanks everybody for, for coming. Um, as one of the organizers, I'd like to thank the organizers for the chance to give this talk. Um, but um, yeah, so this is a bit unusual. I, I, I really want to just kind of establish a little bit of language, reminders for some people, maybe introduce it for others, and to give some idea of, I guess, things we know how to do, which is not all that much, and things we don't know how to do, which is, which is, which is a lot, and, and just sort of different levels of abstraction on the more, on the more network side as we, as we think about, hopefully, some, some projects that some of us can, can, can work on together. Okay, um, I only have the, the, I have the full abstract here for completion, but I purposely made the top part very small because you're not actually supposed to read that part, but, but two things I want to remind us of. Um, if I do the job I want to do, I will actually only use very, very little for me to talk. So hopefully, you know, the, the less I talk, the better. You know, my parents would be very proud of me for making such a comment. Um, and, and, I, and I'm hoping that we should try to, um, you know, we said, you know, have a stage for some interesting and concrete, you know, maybe even concrete projects that we can come up with together that some people will continue to work on. Okay, so 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 those two are the last two sentences of, of the abstract, or just to sort of highlight that's what I want. Please interrupt me. Okay. Um, oh yeah, important things are in pink and Comic Sans. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so there's a couple different flavors of issues, and I'm not, I'm not trying to claim that these are the only ones, but, but there's a couple that I see. And, and um, the thing is, let's suppose I am generalizing some data structure. So I might be starting with an ordinary graph, which, is, which only has connections yes or no, and I might be trying to generalize that in various ways. And, and there's sort of two, two kind of things that can happen. And, and, and one is that there might be different choices to make, and the problem you're studying might have a lot to say about what choice is, is good to make, right? So, so this notion of there might be only one, say, type of clustering coefficient for unweighted networks um, and undirected networks, but there might be many types for some more complicated thing. Right, so 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 sort of a degeneracy in that sense, and, and choices that you have to make when you're when you're generalizing. Um, one one example um, where this can arise. Um, let's suppose I have weights that tell me uh, the strength of a relationship. So if two things, if, if if in my adjacency matrix, if two things have a larger a larger value, that means they're more tightly they're more tightly somehow um, intertwined in some way. But what if I instead have a method that's based on what are known as walks on a network? And I want to have a notion of distance. But a distance, a higher distance, means they're, they're further apart from each other. So if I'm given distances as a sort of natural stuff from the data, but I want a weighted, uh, a weighted network, I have to somehow convert distances to weights. And, and there's going to be more than one way to do that. And it might be that you shouldn't do it and all that. You know, so, so, so sometimes these generalizations might, might actually cause some problems. But the point is that there's more than one way to do it. So that's one thing that can happen. Um, another thing that can happen is that some con convenient feature like a, like a theorem that you're relying on, like say the perron frobenius theorem. If you don't know what that is right now, don't worry about that. But there might be some theorem that you're relying on that if I generalize the, the data structure I'm working with, I may lose that theorem. And so generalizing the data structure is nice in terms of throwing away less information, but if I lose my ability to use a certain method, that's a cost, right? So, so there's this, this trade-off both in terms of choices that one might need to make when you make something more general and in terms of convenient properties that you might lose. Right, so those are a couple things um, that can occur. Um, just to put us on the same page, uh, so the simplest type of network is a graph. There is a picture on the left. This actually originally came from a slide that one of my 2006 undergraduates did for his undergraduate presentation, and I've been using it for almost 20 years now. <laughs> um, that undergrad, that then undergraduate by the na way is named Eric Kelsick, and if you look him up, you'll see he's done some interesting things since then. Um, okay, so one of the things that we like to do, let me see if I have the, okay, the lights, that we like to turn things into adjacency matrices, applied mathematicians like to turn things into linear algebra problems, because we, we like linear algebra. So you can take a graph and you can turn it into an adjacency matrix, and in this case you have a zero if two things are not adjacent to each other, and you have a one if they are. So that's the sort of simplest thing that we could do, and we're not going to typically have only six, it's going to typically be larger, but you have some matrix and you have, you want to look at properties of the matrix, you want to get some eigenvalues, get some eigenvectors, or maybe do other things in the matrix. They might have some banded structures. We saw matrices with banded structures already in the last talk, right? So, so there's some structures within that. Now, as a note, as a terminology note, um, when I tend to use the term network, 
you know, not in every paper, but when I tend to use it, I tend to be referring only to the structure, and I, and, I, and I tend to really separate the structure and dynamics that way when I use language. But I know that there is a lot of papers, and I've seen this in mathematical neuroscience, among other places, where people will use the networks and have dynamics built into it. So, so another thing to be careful about is just people are using the words in different ways, and so when you're looking through the literature, just... I mean, for one thing, as long as they define how they're using it, we should all be good, but you should be, you know, so that's something to watch out for. Um, okay, so this thing here I call an adjacency matrix is sometimes in certain contexts called a connectivity matrix. I tend to prefer the term adjacency matrix. Um, and you can generalize these in lots of ways, and I'm going to show throughout these slides some examples and some things we might want to be considering in, 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 in some of these projects that we're going to be working on together. Um, so you can account for directions. We already saw directions in the last, in the last talk. We can account for weights. I think we at least had weights alluded to. I don't remember if we actually saw numbers, but certainly alluded to them. We can have multiple relationships at once. This is called multiplexity. This can certainly occur. Things can change in time. We clearly saw that. And you can have other complications. You can have annotations. You can have what are called polyadic or high order interactions. There's lots of different complications. And people like me and others spend time doing it. And so some things that we like to do, this is not a not a full list. We like to come up with generative models of random graphs. Oh, yes, please. So I would like to point out that the whole idea of learning is the idea of changes in the adjacency A matrix. Absolutely. Be it in the generation of the Absolutely. or Absolutely. The on the weight. Of Absolutely. The weight. Absolutely. Yes. So um, there's a, one, one piece of terminology in the, in the mathematical literature and physics literature is adaptive networks and co-evolving networks. And, and, and applications from neuroscience have been a big motivation for a very big motivation for a lot of that work. Absolutely. Um, there's actually a recent review article on adaptive networks that I cite towards the end of the slide from 2023. So I'll point you. It's on the theoretical side, but it's, it's recent, which is good. Um, what else did I want to mention? Oh, yeah. So in terms of Sarah's comment as well, when you change the connectivity, this is a modification, say, of changing a 1 to a 0. That's a very, you know, in, in some sense, big type of modification. And changing the weights might be you change 1 to 1 plus epsilon might be a smaller one. So, so those two, whether, whether you want to call it large or small, can also have an impact on how you want to deal if, if you're doing, like, say, a perturbation theory. Um, Okay, so we like generative models of, say, random graphs. Sometimes it's null models. Sometimes it's trying to make it complicated. We like local measures of clustering or other motifs. We like measuring importance of nodes and edges. We like doing middle scale clustering type stuff. Right? There are various sort of things that networks people like, like to do. And, and some of them can have some relevance um, to neuroscience and other, other fields. And, and when we're thinking of more complicated things, uh, a question we often ask is, you know, some of these things that we know and love, how do we, how do we somehow generalize them to more complicated, those more complicated situations? OK, this is one type of random graph. There are more complicated ones that are used. Many of them build on this. These are known as configuration model random graphs. There is a review article on this um, from 2018 by, by Bailey Fosdick and others. And one of the things that I really like about that article is that it points out that it's not the configuration model, that even at the simplest level, you're already making choices. And those choices can be consequential. Um, and they are illustrated by this very Seussian picture that is in the archive version of this paper, but sadly not in the published version. <laughs> and I don't know the story behind that, but shame on Siam for not letting them do this um, because this is lovely. There's a poem that goes with it that's in that article, so you can look that up. Um, this is not me, but you know, this is the type of thing I would do if I had thought of it. Um, so you could have no self loops or multi edge or multi or self edges or multi edges. You could have self-edges but no multi-edges. You could have multi-edges or no self-edges, and you can have both. Um, in a configuration model, you fix a degree sequence. So what a degree sequence is, is if I, have, if I have five friends, that's a five. If someone else has seven friends, that's a seven. So it's just this list of the numbers of neighbors. Um, and um, you connect the ends of the edges, and you do it with what's called a random matching. So you connect them uniformly at random. And if you have other more complicated types of, of, of random graph models that build on this, you can fix in some constraints. So configuration models are really a baseline of a, of a bunch of, a bunch of um, very, um, very flexible models. Um, you can also fix a, a degree distribution in a functional form and draw a sequence from that. So it's not quite the same. And you have to ask whether you have self-edges or multi-edges. So there are variants of, of configuration models, both with and without. They're used as a null model for what's called community detection, which is a type of clustering. So you might say, does your actual network have 
more clustering statistically in comparison to some baseline, and this type of model is a very common choice for a baseline because it has the ability to fix some of the data but randomize the rest of it. And the more complicated versions fix more of the data and randomize the rest of it. Um, and what, the, what this paper illustrates and why I'm pointing you to it is that the choices that are typified by these things actually give you different baselines and can change what's statistically significant or not. So the details matter. Can I ask? Yes, please. Um, uh, Multi-edges versus uh, weighted edges, like joining them, does it make any difference? Or? It can, but also a weighted edge doesn't have to be an integer. Okay. And a multi-edge would have to be an integer. So if I did a multi-edge in this case, I would consider it a weighted edge, but the baseline type of this model is an unweighted model. And if you also do things statistically with having weights, you have to actually think of the difference between shuffling and rewiring. And so the, the statistical baselines from a perspective of random graphs are much more complicated with weights than without. So, so, there are, so, so for certain calculations, it won't matter. For other calculations and some conceptual things, it'll matter a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the simplest model already has choices. We're going to be making choices when we model. We just, we just are. Um, a thing people like to do, and I know there's some people at the, at the workshop who I think will hopefully talk about some of this, but graph Laplacian matrices, I'm purposely making it plural as well because there's more than one type. Um, we have some discussion of some baseline ones in a review article that I and some others did on um, random walks and diffusion on networks. Laplacian is a linearized or is a discrete type of diffusion. So, so think, of, think of heat spreading, but in a discrete way. There is multiple types. A combinatorial one is to take the matrix of the degrees. So this is coming from the degree sequence minus A, which is the adjacency matrix. That's one type of Laplacian. Um, you can also get one that's based on random walks. You can also incorporate a couple of other, other, other sorts of types. And so one of the things people like to do when they say they're doing spectral methods is that they take one of these matrices and something depends on the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of those matrices. Often the leading one, but sometimes some others, right? So, so, so the term spectral, Right, so it means ghosts, but it also means eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, and, 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 and this will matter. You know, one of the times it will matter is that a lot of methods use the fact that the, the most important, that the leading eigenvector, that the, the, the largest magnitude eigenvector, is real. There are methods that use the fact that it's real. Now let's suppose I make my network directed, and so my matrix is asymmetric. I am no longer guaranteed that it's real, so these methods that need it to be real have to somehow be changed. Even though directions are important, I might lose a bunch of my methods. So when you're doing this balance of how complicated you make your model, there's the can I afford to lose the method that I think is the right approach, but that might have to be generalized if I keep certain data. This is one reason why people will often do things in a more simplistic, simplistic way, because the more complicated thing that we know how to represent the data in, because we can, we can write down the matrix, that's not the hard part. It's the we might lose properties that we care about and that we need. Okay, so one generalization, weighted networks. Um, people use the term weighted networks to mean edge-weighted networks typically, but you can technically also have node weights, and I know of some context in which that's relevant, um, but there's actually not so much work that's been done on node-weighted networks, and so just as a note, people just use this term, but they mean that. So this is gonna be having valued entries in this adjacency matrix, um, or weighted matrix or weighted adjacency matrix. Large values indicate stronger connections, in a distance matrix, large values indicate weaker, weaker connections. And so the data may arise most naturally as a cost. Distance is abstract, right? Distance could be time, distance could be some other cost. But it's something that things are farther apart um, when, they are, uh, when they're larger. Also, I'm putting distances in quotes. Another reason is that you might have some asymmetric situation. Those are mathematically called divergences, but I'm not necessarily guaranteeing it's a, a metric in mathematical language. Uh, but some, some notion of distance or cost might be the natural way that you measure your data. Or sometimes some weights might be the natural way. And when you convert from one to the other, as I mentioned, well, you have to worry about it. Um, right. So if you do a weighted generalization of something, I haven't actually defined what a local clustering coefficient is, but think of if I have a triplet of nodes how, and, and I have two of the edges, how often do I have the third and some ways of counting that. Um, there's sort of a straightforward way to normalize it if you don't have weights. But if I do have weights, should I use the algebraic mean? Should I use the geometric mean? So again, there's different choices and it's not clear for a given application which, which sort of choice might, might be the best. Um, 
a conceptual trickiness. This relates to the answer to, to your question from, from, from earlier. Um, if I generalizing random graph models to weight to weighted situations is actually conceptually very tricky. Because if I if I have pieces of given weights and move them around, that is a different model from redistributing. Mathematically, that those are different models. So, so the interesting thing is there's certain generalizations that are harder if you add time dependence or harder if you make things have multiple types of connections. Whereas other types of generalizations, those are relatively straightforward, but adding weights is the hard part. For random graph models, adding weights happens to be a conceptually very tricky part because of the choices that you make. Sorry, I thought I heard it. Yes, please. How, how do you, uh, what's your feeling about um, thresholding? I hate so. it. Personally, <laughs> that, being, that, be, that being said, if I, need, if I need a method where I don't want to make, okay, maybe you have to make a choice for the threshold, maybe you do multiple thresholds. If I need a method that the approach, that the, that the idea that I'm taking is just so crucial that, that I need a threshold, then I'd still be willing to do it. Um, but I feel like there are a lot of methods that don't require you doing it. But yes, there, there, there are times, even, even though I answered it in a very snarky way, which is my, my way, as it were, um, there are times when it's useful, but I feel like there's actually still a lot of methods that you can do stuff without it. Um, one thing that I guess um, maybe, maybe, maybe Mu Chung will talk about it later in his, in his talk, you can, you can, there are certain ways to threshold basically at multiple choices at once to avoid this issue of saying, I only have one choice. And so then if you have the sequence of all the thresholds, then you're still keeping the information. So I think, so, so that's, that's at 2.30 today. Um, okay, any other, any other questions or comments? So these are great, keep them coming. Uh, directed networks. Okay, so there are, now I had trouble actually finding a review article on um, directed networks, which was a bit of a surprise. There are books on directed graphs or digraphs, but those books are very theoretically oriented and are not really getting to the issues that I think are relevant for a lot of the stuff I care about and for this audience. And, and I, I didn't actually, so it's interesting, I didn't actually find a review article that I like. Um, I did find something that talks about clustering um, and community detection. So that was just, that's from Googling, so I can, I, I can, I can, say less that I know about this review article than some of the others that I'm pointing, but I wanted to give you something. One of the reasons is that because things like spectral clustering is so popular, if you lose the, the leading eigenvalue being real, then all of spectral theory has to be rebuilt to accommodate that. Um, there are people who, who do that. I don't know exactly how far they've gotten in, in different directions. So Jürgen Joost is one example of a person who spent a lot of time doing that. But, but the thing is, a, a, a adjacency matrix of a directed network it's easy to write down. I can write down the mathematical object, but, but losing the symmetry, I lose, so the matrix is generically no longer symmetric, and therefore losing the fact that the leading eigenvalue is real has such a consequence for what we're able to do, even though it's very easy to write down the representation. And we, we, we know directions and, and, and causal relationships are crucial for what we're doing, yet there's whole classes of methods that we lose I mean, this also gives challenges saying, what are the classes of methods that we want to generalize for these more complicated structures, right? So, so the notion of having spectral methods that allow eigenvalues, the leading ones, to be complex, this is desirable, right? So these also suggest mathematical problems when we have something that clearly conceptually is important, but that we lose fundamental mathematical properties when we do it. Okay, so for graph Laplacians, what this would have to mean is that you actually have to choose between in and out degree. So in is incoming edges, out is out, outgoing edges. Sorry, is there a question? Someone raised their hand. Yes. Yeah, so you're, you're talking about losing the leading eigenvalue being real specifically for the Laplacian or the Laplacian? Laplacian and the adjacency matrix and some other matrices that one might want, not necessarily for every matrix. So one of the ways around it might be to construct a matrix that does not lose that property and then work with that matrix. So you have, so for convenience theorem applies. You yeah, you, you want it, yeah, it's often desirable to construct a matrix so that you can use Perron for Right, yes. so you can lose the symmetry but keep the leading eigenvalue. You might, be, sometimes you might be able to, yeah, yeah. So, so it's not an all, it's all, not an all or none, but just sort of the sort of standard ones that we like to d default to will lose it and then you might construct something another way so that this other matrix has the property you want. Yeah, that, that's right. And yes, Perron for is, we are, when we've been generalizing various ideas, to more complicated situations. A common goal is to be what matrix can we construct so that we have Perron for that, 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 that is a very common thing in a lot of these papers. Um, okay. 
Um, so yeah, so this was actually the same one, the same screenshot from the last time, but what I didn't show you in the other part is that it was actually considered a directed case. The interesting thing is you also need to be a little careful with what's um, written in some books. So there's, so Mark Newman's t Networks textbook, which I love, I teach out of that book. This is uh, undergraduate level, I, I teach an upper division course. It's, it's more of a physics book, but I still use it for, a math, um, for my math course and it's, it's nice. That book literally says you cannot define a Laplacian for directed networks. That's wrong. It, but that book says that. You actually can, you just have to choose in versus out degree. And if you're thinking of random walks, out degree happens to be more appropriate because you're thinking about something moving on a network, so you want to know where it goes out. So, so you have to worry about in versus out, but yeah, um, I should get Mark to correct that. It's a simple correction. Um, okay, let's see. Um, there's other things you might want to do. This green one here is actually tricky. I don't know if we necessarily need, well, the first one we don't probably need for the whole, so much for this. Motifs are small, there's different ways of defining motifs, but small, small subgraphs that in principle should repeat, but you can also have dynamical versions of it. Let's just say you have a directed network. Clustering coefficients where you're trying to say when is the third leg of the triangle um, actually present or not, in a directed case is actually really tricky. I only know a couple papers trying to do it and I don't find them, those papers very satisfactory. So, like, so it's just conceptually it becomes odd. How, what, what does it even mean? Do you want to, do you want to consider both um, directions present or not? So, so that, can get, that can get tricky. Um, the various baseline models, if I change something and have it directed, the baselines will change. Directed versus undirected, will, among other things, have a factor of two that's different because of um, an edge in an undirected network will correspond to two elements in the adjacency matrix because I is adjacent to A if and only if J is adjacent to I. An element in a directed network will correspond to one. It will be just I adjacent to J. So, so there's a factor of two that naturally occurs in formulas. But the, the baseline models will also change if you are generalizing to something more complicated. And so that's also something to keep in mind. And in some cases, there are some known models. So when I say known models, this would be a generalization of a configuration like model in this case or some, some more complicated thing. Um, there are some statistical inference methods, and I'm not going to define this now, but degree corrected stochastic block model is, is, is one popular one that don't care about such things. They, make, they care about different things. They make different assumptions. But so, some of the inferential type methods, as long as you can actually have your representation in a well-defined way, they, they, they are can, they're sort of agnostic to a couple of these other things. Um, some of the local methods, there are, some, there are some local methods for clustering, which I would say are underexploited, but are very interesting. Some of them are based on personalized versions of page rank. Um, again, I can refer you to references if you want details. Some of those want a real leading eigenvalue as well, because they, they have spectral little parts of how they do things. Usually, they don't have to. But. Okay, sign networks. I can show you a picture from a paper that has some neuroscience. This is a picture uh, and a, from, a, from a paper that um, I and others did with, with Danny Bassett. Um, and so you might start with some sort of image. You might parcelate it. But every arrow, every step is horrible, by the way. And choices are being made with every step, just to make it clear, right? So, so there's choices being made all the time. So you might, you might parcelate it in some way. Um, then you have a bunch of time series in each of these parts that somehow average over all the, all the voxels in those parts. So you then might say, well, I'm going to measure similarity in some way, do some horrible thing, and then you might threshold it. Um, okay, so if you're going to measure something from, say, a correlation or other, you know, other various notions of similarity, you might actually get something that has signed. Right, so you might get minus ones and plus ones, or you might get an, everything in between minus one and plus one. Um, so it could be zero could mean not just, it could either mean there's not, they're not adjacent, or it could mean they're adjacent but have a correlation of zero. Those are not the same, right? But they both have a zero in the adjacency matrix. Um, there's a very recent review article by Naoki Misuda and others, and then the second author, Zach Boyd, was Andrea Bertozzi's PhD student in the department here. So I can brag about local people a bit, which is something I like to do and then some other familiar names to some of you. Anyway, this is about, so this is correlation networks is a specific part of sign networks. It's not, not everything, um, but it's a review article on that. So it's something that I think should be of interest to many people in this audience. Um, and you know, there, there are times it'll come, there'll be correlations. We've already heard about excitatory versus inhibitory dynamics, which are re re really important. Um, there are, in fact, signed generalizations of some of these null models and some of these methods. They are not as well developed 
So that's another area where there could be more, but, there, but there, there are versions of these configuration models that are respectful of coming from a correlation or are respectful of having signs. Okay, so I, I'm not gonna tell you how it works, but it's, it's of the flavor I gave, but somehow this constraint is, is built in. And so that would then be a null model if you're doing some sorts of clustering there. Um, spectral properties of the adjacency and Laplace matrices. Well, yeah, you might have, you might have trouble um, getting a Perron Frobenius theorem to work. There are ways of manipulating a signed adjacency matrix to get it to work, but I, the only ones I've seen are in very special cases. There might be some I don't know about. So, so there is a gap in, if you, if you care about using what's called a centrality measure to measure the importance of a node or an edge, there's a lot less of that in, these, in this framework than there is elsewhere. There are some. I, only, I actually know of one paper, but it was really super special, and I, do, I suspect it was sufficiently special that it's probably not the way to go. I mean, it's fine for what it did. Um, okay, so you can, you know, threshold weights to obtain an unweighted network. You can make all the weights positive somehow, which is also kind of naughty, but I've done it before. Um, or you can use signed weighted networks. And then, um, just as a note, because I'm using this figure, this, this paper does the um, making weights positive, but having weights, okay? doesn't threshold to zero and ones, but, but, but it's also, it's not having negative correlations as properly, or negative other relations as properly treated as negative. Um, can, you, can you say a little more about good ways to make all the weights positive? Such as I don't know if they're good. <laughs> I would say you'd use different ones and you look at it, because one thing you could do is you could keep only the positive, or you could keep the positive and neg negative separately and treat the negative as if they were positive from some other thing, like in a multi-layer type of representation, for instance. I know I haven't defined what that means yet, but um, you can take the absolute value. I mean, you can do things, but you know, honestly, for me, the reason that they're done is so you can do a certain mathematical or computational thing, not because we actually think they're right, which worries me, which worries me. Um, I saw hands partly go up. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering, I don't know what the norm is in the like, fMRI literature, but if I wanted to go from a covariance matrix to a like adjacency matrix, I would have guessed that the like inverse covariance would be a better thing to threshold to get the the adjacencies. Is that what people do, or, um, or is that not the right? I don't think that's what they do. But I'm I'm, I'm but, but my short answer to your question is I don't know. Um, there, but it sounds you're saying you're saying there are papers that take that approach, or you're saying that that would be a good approach to take. I, I was just curious about what was done because it seems like it's. The, I, I I don't remember seeing it, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's some paper that's done that. But they're usually doing this from the adjacency matrix. So, so what I would say is that I think these, these, these papers give some interesting things. And you know, one of the things that you can also do is you do it one way that has some naughtiness. You see what your results are. You do it a different way that has different naughtiness. And hopefully, the results are consistent. And so there's some notions of consistency. But I still feel that there's a lot of ad hocery. In, in this, this particular thing, there's, there's a lot of ad hocery. And we kind of do it because we have to, not because we actually think it's the best thing to do. And trying to come up with better things to do is desirable. And, and so I think that actually developing more mathematical tools and techniques for signed networks would allow at least some of these steps to be less ad hoc. And so I think that in particular for, for applications like neuroscience, that that's one of the areas where some theoretical work would really benefit the application. Like, I think, I think that's one of, because a lot of the things we like to calculate, we don't know how to do. And so we avoid the signed networks often. And this is the first review article I know on it. It's not the whole topic, but this is the first review article I know on this topic. Sometimes I'm actually citing the latest review article. This is, as far as I know, the review article. OK, a recent thing I've been working on. Um, we're not the only paper that does it, but we tried to assemble a bunch of things. It's not a review, but Lucas Botcher and I have a paper currently undergoing page proofs and all the, all the, all the glories that journals give with that on complex networks with complex weights. This is one of the favorite paper titles I've ever, ever had. I almost never use the term complex networks because a complex network is the same as a network. But <laughs> to, to have this paper title, it had to be done. Um, so you can have complex valued things, and it may be less intuitive why you might want that. So this is a generalization of the signed case, if you want. If you're doing what's called quantum walks, that will work out. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of physics applications. But actually, it also shows up in other applications. It shows up, for instance, in, in artificial types of neural networks. There's actually a couple papers that were even shows up in biological neural networks, but I only found a couple papers. There's a couple coupled oscillator networks papers that it comes in. But it definitely comes in a lot in, the, in machine learning type literature and graph signal processing and so on. And so there are reasons to do this. 
Um, it's related to also what's called magnetic Laplacians, if you've, if you've seen that. Um, and there's not much, there's been some work using these things, but the, but the field, is, or the field has little bits and pieces. There is um, not much network analysis to, to generalize. And one um, type of thing that one has to worry about is if it's Hermitian or not, because you get certain guarantees, like the chemistry applications in molecular orbital theory tend to be Hermitian, so you can do certain things. So that's one of the things that I'm excited about. I only have one paper on this so far, but it's, it's when I'm able to combine things from network science and mathematical physics, which is part of my origins, it makes me happy. So, so you know. Um, and then I was thinking about this recently. It's because I was, I was hosting uh, Nick Trefethen. So things like pseudospectra and non-normal matrices ought to be relevant for this, but that's not something I've thought about deeply yet. But, um, and Lucas did, ask, did actually ask me, if any folks at the workshop have thoughts on this, we want to know. Okay, that's a bit more of a personal, personal current one. Um, another thing I've spent time on that I know has crept into the um, neuro literature is multilayer networks. As a note on terminology, this is not the same as the way the term is used in machine learning. Okay, so, so, so just to make sure that that intuition doesn't, doesn't creep in in cases where it should not. Um, we have an old review article, which is amazingly 10 years old at this point, um, and there's much more recent work as well. One of the very tutorially minded references that I would bring up is Manlio de Domenico's book from last year. Um, so it's, and so, so this, and there's been a lot of work, the intervening time between 2014 and 2022, there's a lot. The thing that happens though a lot in network science is, is, is that people move on to the next big thing before they've finished solving the problems. Like they do that a lot. So, so multi-layer networks, even though it's less active than it was a few years ago, we still don't know most things really if people are being honest with themselves. Um, they moved on. They moved on because there was the next big thing, which you know, hypergraphs and so on. But there, there's still a lot that we need to, we need to learn. Um, you can actually, instead of having a matrix, you can have a tensor. It does have a tensorial structure. It is not just an array, but the tensorial structure is something that has not been exploited as much as just being a higher dimensional array. So that's another area where, where at least from a theorist's point of view, it's interesting work. It's less clear to me if that stuff would help on the neuroscience end. But there are things that one can spend time on. You can flatten them to look like this, to have a larger matrix. So you might think that this is maybe one type of connection. One, this is a second, this is a third. Okay, so different types of connections, one way to do it, or different subsystems is another, another thing that one can do. The blocks uh, on the diagonal are the standard type of edges. These are intralayer edges in this language. The blocks on the off diagonal are the interlayer edges. A very natural question to ask is what the hell do these mean? Um, it tends to be harder to understand interlayer edges conceptually than intralayer edges. In most applications, it tends to be harder to have reliable measurements of values for interlayer edges and inter intralayer edges. And so when I talk about costs of a more complicated representation, we can keep more information, but the cost of can we have trustworthy values to measure is potentially a very big cost. Yes? I'm still not sure I follow what what the multi-layer Right, so I haven't is. given you a mathematical and, definition, and, but... Uh, contrast it to hypernetworks? Um, so, okay, so by hypernetwork, I assume you mean hypergraph. People don't tend to use hypergraph. Um, hypergraphs are for polyadic interactions. So say three people are in the room at once. I have an edge that's around all three, whereas multi-layer network says two people, maybe they're adjacent, they have an adjacency from being relatives, but maybe they also have an adjacency from being coworkers. And both of those are there at the same time. So, the, so, this, so one of them so is putting... Extra, one, extra edges. Labels on the edges or labels, labels on, the, on the, edges, the nodes. Or the same number of nodes. Doesn't have to have the same number of nodes. That is not required. That is a mathematical convenience. Some papers erroneously say that's required. It is not required except possibly for the calculations they're doing. Does not have to have the same. If it's easier if it does, but it's not a requirement conceptually. But, but the nodes should not be completely disjoint. The set of nodes in the one yeah, it's it's trivial. should have some overlap to be meaningful. So mathematically, it wouldn't be required, but if you want to have any use for doing this, you want that to occur. Okay. Yes. Um, you can't. You can't. You can impose those restrictions. In, in practice, the data would be different in those cases, so it wouldn't be imposed restrictions, but it would be differences that arise. But you can impose restrictions if you want. I was wondering the the architecture itself. Does that impose anything? This architecture does not. Um, you can actually also have more than one type of layering, but I only wrote down one. Um, there is a mathematical definition of this, which I haven't given. I just wanted to give a picture. Yeah. So, quick question. So, does that mean that the, the multi-layer network is essentially a network where the 
Edges are basically vectors. Um, you can think of them that way, but that's not quite true because you can also have an edge from, say, node one on layer one to, to node two on layer two. And so that actually breaks the vector thing there a little bit. You had a question as well? No, no, I just wanted to comment. Like the, the one you've, the example you've drawn here, the omegas are simply indicating that it's the same node. In this case, oh, yeah. In yeah. Layer, so, yes. So which I can. means if layer one, for example, is anatomical connections. That's a very different type of quantity uh, uh, than uh, uh, omega, which is just like a label. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, um, so um, um, setting omega does seem really arbitrary there. Yeah, so so for some applications, when omega doesn't have to be the same. This example is the same, and these, these zeros here can also not can be non-zero. So this is really just a specific case. Um, but yes, there are going to be some applications where, you know, what the hell is omega? What omega is supposed to mean is that the layers are not independent, but saying something is not independent is much easier than saying, well, what should the independence actually be? And so, so this has been very convenient. We have used these, and others have used these and other things. Um, um, I know that there's a, at least some people in the audience who've, who've done some work on, on these things, so I don't, I don't know if they're going to mention these in their talks. But there are going to be times that the cost of having the more complicated representations too high, and one of the costs is, well, I don't know what these things really mean. So one of the, one of the things that I think is very useful that people you know, they think it's still worth doing, is trying to, to address those problems in more areas. You know, you know maybe, it's, maybe the cost is too high for some of them, but um, then the, 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 this bottom part's just because I got the schematic from there. Um, okay. So let me just show you one other thing where this connects in, and then I am talking too much, I apologize, but it is what it is. This picture is also from another paper with uh, Danny Bass and company. So imagine that we have a time series from different parts of the brain, and you can also use um, layers as, as, as from coming from time windows, if you aggregate with time windows. Um, there's another nasty thing there, it's I'm chopping up time series, which is worry, worrisome. Um, but you can have different layers as representing different, different times. Um, and so this has been a way to look at what I would call multi-layer representations of time-dependent networks. And there's been a bunch of um, work including, you know, so, so Danny, so this started out with some work that Danny Bassett and, and I and others did. This 2011 paper was the first one that was applying these ideas to neuroscience, but then there's been quite a bit since then. It's just weird for me to see these papers of mine that are 14 years old. This problem doesn't get better, does it? Um, but but um, there's been a lot of work doing that in, diff in different ways. So measures of what people sometimes call flexibility and so on. Um, but there's, there's big costs. Um, anyway, so this is something that people spend time on. And then you can, a game that we like to play is, well, take these random graph models and Laplacians and centralities and whatever, and can we generalize them for these more complicated structures? Right? This, this, is, this, is, this is something that as a mathematician, you know, I enjoy. Right? Um, and some of these are hopefully relevant to, to this. And yeah, so Perón Fabrinius came up earlier. Construct it in a way that you can apply the Perón Fabrinius theorem. So there's some work with, 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 with Dane Taylor. Um, Dane had to cancel, so he won't actually be at the conference, but he was going to be. I don't know if he was going to talk about this project, but we took these centrality measures, which are measures of importance, and we found ways of constructing multi-layer versions of them, including for time dependence and, and for others, where we have this larger matrix where we can still have a Perron Frobenius theorem, and that allowed us to adapt the theorems that we needed to have well-defined measures of importance of things and how they change through time in this case. And, and, and constructing things in a way to be able to have a Perron Frobenius theorem was really the hard work in the paper. Okay. Um, so this got brought up earlier. Oh, I didn't put it in pink, but I still put it in Comic Sans and Bold. So Giovanni Petri is here. This is an article by him and others. I forgot to put this in pink. Um, it was funny why you had brought stuff up earlier. Anyway, so there's a couple review articles. There's actually more than these two, but these are two of the, of the subset that, 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 that exist. I can point you to others. There's a more mathematical one by, by, by Chris Bick and company, and then there's a, an influential physics-oriented one from Giovanni and his collaborator from a few years ago. Um, this is to do polyadic, or what's sometimes called higher order relationships. I prefer the term polyadic, but for Google purposes, the term higher order will show up. But you know, we also have higher order and Taylor series, like x plus x squared and so on. So, so to me, it's a bit odd. Um, two very common representations, the two that I see the most, are hypergraphs and simple social complexes. There are actually some other representations as well. 
the, again, we play the game of generalizing structural measurements and analysis and, and, and what is the influence for dynamics. Do these things make it easier to synchronize or more, more precisely, when do they make it easier to synchronize and when do they make it harder to synchronize? And one of the big parts is to try to really get a handle on exactly what conditions make certain dynamics more, easier to occur and exactly what conditions make it harder to occur. That's, that's the thing that people are currently thinking about um, and that is, that is a, a deep question. Um, there is a modeling choice. Simplicial complexes require downward closure in the sense that let's just say I have um, a face in the form of a, or let's say I have a tetrahedron then I have to also have all the faces of the tetrahedron and I also have all the edges, whereas hypergraphs can have a, don't have to have everything in the subset. So that is an important modeling choice and it will affect things. Um, and then we will hear more about thing, the, the simplicial complex aspect of it um, later today, so 2.30. And apologies, I have to teach during your talk, so I will not see it, but everyone else here will enjoy it. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about dynamics. I talked a, little, a bit earlier, but I want to be more explicit. Um, I have a tutorial that I wrote with James Gleason. Very, it's very short, which is meant to just be, if you've never seen dynamics on networks from this sort of mathematical point of view and you want to get started, this is there, um, 72 pages, very short, um, a, for a mathematician. Yes. Um, I have trouble writing short things, some, some of you know that. Um, there's another paper, much more specific, but I want to highlight it because it does have um, a bunch of um, applications, at least to mathematical neuroscience. So Stephen Coombs led this. I, I, know, I know that he and some others there are familiar names to you folks. Um, and so this is looking at oscillatory networks, but so some of the, some of the mathematical neuro models show, show up there. And this it gives an idea of when can you do things like um, um, I mean, master stability functions or you know, weakly nonlinear, strongly nonlinear, phase reduction, phase amplitude, and trying to, trying, to, trying to talk about when you can do certain ones. And I know I've mentioned a bunch of words that I have not defined for you folks, but, but if you're interested, that's there. Um, how does network structure affect dynamics? So this is also one of the big motivations for studying structure on its own. That's again, a big question. Um, maybe faster synchronization for networks that have certain architectures. Um, maybe slower flow of something. You might do a blood flow. There's actually a couple models, simplistic models, that have um, uh, oscillators coupled to random walks. So the random walks is a, a simplification of doing blood flow. And so if you want to do something with fMRI measurements, that might be an interesting type of model to pursue further, where you actually have random walks and oscillators coupled together. Um, this is a Kuramoto-like model. I get to be the first to show a Kuramoto model in the workshop. It's a proud point for me. I want to point out the function here. I, have, I haven't given, I've, I've written in a somewhat more general way than usual. Um, omega is a natural frequency. This is phase only. Notice that this function f, so I have, say, neurons i and j that are, that are interacting with each other, function of the difference of their phases. This is known as diffusive coupling. If I linearize that and have a non-zero linear term, I'm getting those graph Laplacians. And so a very fundamental connection between graph Laplacian type things and dynamics is when you have diffusive coupling. That is really where, where a bunch of those things imply very deeply on the dynamics. It's not the only type of coupling, but it's, but it's, it's one people like to study. I think partly because Laplacians show up. <laughs> so there's a little bit of circularity, right? Because we know how to work with Laplacians, so let's make our Laplacians show up. Um, there is better, much better, developed theory for what's known as autonomous systems. This is when I do not have an explicit time dependence on the right-hand side. Okay, so, so, so time can show up, but it's not explicit versus non-autonomous. And so you have to go back to dynamical systems and generalize stuff. Yes, please. Just a comment that <clears throat> when you think of applications to neuroscience, considering non-autonomous systems becomes very important. Absolutely. Because when you see a correlation between two neurons, you don't know whether it's because they are connected or because they are receiving... Absolutely, input. absolutely. And that's a very important thing to be able to... Absolutely, control. absolutely. But then we lose things like linear stability analysis, we have to start from the ground up, right. right? Like the things that we love to do that are in the textbooks. There are some notions, um, but stable and unstable manifolds. The reason I wrote these is because these I know happen to have a notion. There's, there's um, various types of Lagrangian coherent structure type stuff. But, but like you have to generalize the, the very fundamentals from the ground up to do it. And so yeah, more work on non-autonomous systems would be, would be lovely. Would be absolutely lovely. If you if you look at if you look at textbooks, even even most of the graduate textbooks, what they'll do is that they'll say these things exist, and then they'll spend the rest of the book 
not analyzing them. No, I mean, I mean I'm serious. I mean, it is, it is so, so, yeah, so, so this is something that can use much more. I mean, you can write it down and simulate it, but we want to have more understanding than just, than just doing a brute force simulation. Just set t prime equals one and add another equation. Yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, yes, that's technically true, but that doesn't solve the actual problem. Yeah, I know the books act like that actually solves the problem, which is which is sort of a, yeah. There's this is I forgot there's lifting or whatever. I mean, you can do this for certain theorems, but it doesn't solve the real problem in terms of trying to get insights into physical and other systems. Okay, um, I've written this as dynamical systems, but actually you can also have things that are stochastic processes as well. So I'm not trying to exclude noise. It's just that if if I start saying stochastic process, I might start talking about. Um, like limit sets or whatever, I might use different terminology or do Markov chains and whatnot. So, so those are also choices. I am. So there's also dynamics of networks. I've shown this slide before. There's a couple of, um, sometimes we use the term temporal networks. There's a couple of review articles by, by Petr Holme. Um, you can do discrete versus, can you say I'm chopping up time series? <laughs> Which I have done, right? You can see we're doing that right here. I've done that in the paper, but you know, why should I chop it here and not there? So, so continuous time type things are also, and there's some work on that, but there, I think that's some, so, so I think there can be a lot more there. Um, okay, so this was also brought up earlier. Um, adaptive networks, sometimes also called co-evolving, depending on that. This is a schematic from this review article. There's actually two review articles that came out recently. Um, a subset of the authors are the same. I like this one better, although it has some flaws too. I actually discovered one of them yesterday when I was, um, uh, or my own view of it having a flaw when I was preparing these slides. So, so this is a nice article. It's, it's more theoretically oriented. Um, the idea is that you have coupling between dynamics on networks and dynamics of networks. So we say adaptive and they, they, they somehow um, you know, connect with each other. And I'm writing this down as dynamical systems, but you can also have this with stochastic processes and so on. Um, they did something very odd. In the context of oscillators, they mentioned two things as, as, and did not highlight a third, which I thought weird that they didn't highlight. So I'll tell you the two things they highlighted. They highlighted adaptive weights, right? So Sarah was bringing up some of these from the very beginning of the talk that this is really important. Um, so X dot, this is like the theta dot that I showed for Kuramoto, but it doesn't have to actually be phase only. It has some intrinsic dynamics and it has the coupling to everything else, and this kappa ij is giving the strength of the coupling to everything else. And the idea behind adaptive weights is that instead of this being constant, this is itself a function, and so now instead of having an n-dimensional dynamical system, I have an n-squared dimensional dynamical system. So this is much higher dynamics than if I did not have adaptive weights. Okay, that's one thing that can happen. Another thing that can happen, this paper says less well studied, but I didn't actually go and verify it, so the question is just, oh yes, please. Just interrupting. No, please do. So, um, in the adaptive network weights, one thing that usually help us is that the dynamics of the weights is much slower than yes. the dynamics of so, the excess. So you do a multi-scale type of... So you can do some kind of adiabatic approximation. Okay, okay, absolutely. Because it's a much slower process right. than the, right. the change of state. And there, there, are, there are various mathematical theories related to that. I mean, the term, so when people say multi-scale systems, when people say fast, slow, dynamical systems, those are all doing approximations of that form. And yes, and then, then you, you, you work on the, the slow dynamics or the slow manifold and you hopefully can solve that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so this is writing down the problem before you've made a simplification. Um, yes, no, those simplifications are crucial to get anywhere. Um, I mean, again, you can simulate the whole thing with brute force, but I, I, I don't find that very satisfactory. Um, I mean, you, you do it when you have to, but that's not really what, at least for, I'm a mathematician, that's not really what I want to do is the whole thing. Um, okay, so this adaptive time delays, so now we have a time delay, and now that's becoming our, our variable instead of the other, also n squared dimensional. The less well studied I wrote there, because the paper said that, I did not go and verify whether that's true, so I didn't want to make that promise, and so the question mark was, okay, I didn't actually check, but the paper, this paper makes the claim that that's less well studied than this one. And the one they didn't show, which I thought was really strange, because then you get a two n dimensional system, not n squared, and I know I've seen it. The frequencies, these natural frequencies can also be adaptive, but they didn't show that example in that discussion in the paper. So that's why I'm saying a flaw I found yesterday. I found that very strange that they would not mention this. This is actually mathematically simpler than the other two because it's less dimensional. And I know I've seen it, I have seen this, so, so I'm not, so you may have to go a different paper to find more of those. Um, you can do this with dynamical systems, which is here, but there's also work on agent-based models. 
in various applications. Um, an example, one example is heavy, and I'm putting this in quotes because they're doing heavy in a sort of here's a mathematical formula as opposed to here's the real thing, right? So it's a toy version of, of heavy and anti heavy and learning and coupled oscillators on networks. There's a bunch of that with Kuramoto models and various others that one, and, that, that one will see in this. It's often hard to make the model simple enough to do math. We might do reductions and so on, right? But this is often a challenge. And so adaptive networks of various types is one wave of the future or in the present, hopefully. Some of the past, too, but we should continue doing it. OK. I just want to let you know we're transitioning into your uh, question period. OK. Yeah, I know. I, my, my, my not talk much, I completely completely failed at that. But I hope, I hope this has been <laughs> helpful. And I'm glad for the questions. OK. So these are repeats of what I wrote before, maybe slightly rephrased in a, in a couple of minor spots. But just to remind you, you can generalize things in different ways and have to make choices. Choices will depend on stuff. You can generalize things and some theorems and whatever you like might go wrong, and so you have to work on that. And this is in bold and in Comic Sans and in pink, so it is super important for all three reasons. Hopefully some of these things can, can be formulated as sort of projects that we come up with through this workshop. And so this is, I hope that this talk helps set up some of the theory. So thank you very much. <laughs>